Welcome back for the second paper. Uh, for the second paper, our presenter is Heather Lee from the um, Bentley University, and the discussant is Michael Shen uh, from AUS. Heather, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sterling. It's nice to see you. Nice to see um, you as well. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Just need an indication that you can see sure. uh, my screen. I'm assuming you can hear me because you responded. Yep, Are we good? See your screen. Yeah, we're good. Okay, great. So I'm using multiple monitors. So if it looks like I'm not looking at you, I do apologize. Um, yes, I use animation when I teach, and we've all taught online, I'm assuming. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. This paper is uh, entitled, Is My Alpia Contagious? The Effect of Investor Culture on Corporate Disclosure Time Orientation. The paper is co-authored with Francois Bouchet from Boston University and Patricia Nuranjo from Rice University. The paper is really motivated by drawing a growing literature that shows culture affects a wide range of economic outcomes, um, including reporting decisions. I think if last year has taught us anything is that um, we've observed that different nations have dealt with the pandemic very differently. And that has led to some very different social and economic consequences. And I think it's really because we are culturally very different across the nations, between the West and the East and the South and the North. And I think that you will agree with me, culture is extremely important because it's a set of beliefs and values are widely shared by a group of people. And this tends to have a very long lasting effect on individuals. We really carry our cultural background with us. Furthermore, um, I think with, um, it's kind of nice with the prior paper talking about all the technology advancements and computing linguistics and so forth. With technology advancement, we're really seeing an increasing um, capital investments flowing across geographic borders. And cultural time orientation of foreign institutional investors may play a very important role in, shape, um, in shaping firm disclosure. Despite of these um, very important issues, we actually found almost no evidence, I guess empirical evidence, on whether cultural roots of the foreign investors and how that shapes the disclosure narrative of their investees. And that's pretty much the starting point of our research uh, question. And we ask, does the cultural background of foreign investors shape the disclosure narratives of their investees? So we do this by looking at annual reports from 37 countries, and we collect the cultural background of institutional investors based on the country of origin from fact set. Our, the main cultural dimension we're really interested in is this, oops, touch screen. It's this time orientation, all right? So gonna be really talking about the time orientation and trying to get a good understanding of it before we get into the empirics and the hypothesis. Our main findings, what do we find? We have three main um, results. Um, the first one, firms located in countries that are culturally more long-term oriented, they tend to disclose more long-term and less forward-looking disclosures. Second, an increase in the cultural time orientation of firms investor base results in more long-term and less forward-looking disclosures. And lastly, investor-induced long-term orientation decreases liquidity and increases cost of capital. In other words, what we really found is that cultural time orientation matters, okay? And it matters on firms' disclosure, how, in, at least in terms of how they present their annual reports to the public. And it matters more because these time orientation characteristics have market consequences in terms of liquidity and cost of capital. 
so looking at some um, related literature on how investor time horizon affects um, disclosure, um, I guess, horizon. We know that exogenous changes in the institutional ownership on US firms tend to increase management forecasts, analyst following, and liquidity, and as well as leading to greater financial statement competitivity across foreign firms. And another very related um, paper shows that firms provide more frequent and informative forecasts when firms are added to the MC, oh, MSCI uh, country world index. So we asked the following question. Does the demand of short-term and forward-looking information varies with the time orientation of the capital market participants? So as I said before, um, before going to, into my enterics, and this is the uh, main thing I want to uh, convey to you is the concept of time orientation. As we presented this paper in the past, I, I think this is the concept we really do need to explain and be clear on, because this is the main thing of our, um, I guess the main proxy we use uh, throughout the paper. So time orientation, there are two key things, the horizon, this one is a bit more intuitive. It basically states that individuals who are more long-term oriented cultures put more emphasis in the future than in the present and the past or the past. The second concept, the time reference, um, states that in linguistics, language with strong future time reference decrease the psychological importance of the future because speakers dissociate the future from the present. So this is the one that tend to um, cause some confusion as people are reading our paper and listening to our presentation. So two examples, we have a short-term and a long-term language. I think most of us here probably speaks a language other than English. So we all know English, right? So English is categorized under the short-term category, okay? And that's because with English and French, we have a lot of future tenses. We refer to the future with future tenses. For example, I will say, I will present, you know, I will go to the park tomorrow or something. So with these strong future tense, you're actually categorized as a short-term oriented <coughs> country because the strong FTR is associated with a low long-term orientation. So you see they're actually opposite, but they're actually representing the same thing. So the idea is because languages such as English and French, because they have these future tenses, because we're using them all the time in our daily languages, we tend to disassociate them. So we don't think about it as much, we don't commit to it as much because we're using these will, going to, and so forth. On the other end, languages such as Mandarin and German, I think probably most of us um, probably know at least Mandarin. Um, it comes from a high long-term oriented um, origin because we don't have these future tenses and they are associated with a weak future tense. Therefore that people who are speaking these languages because they're not using these future uh, words, okay? they're actually thinking about the future more and they're planning for the future because they don't use these future words in their languages. I hope that helps as we move forward talking about some of the um, background, I guess, background studies on um, long-term orientation and future time reference. So we, have, we do have you know, a, a rich literature on the um, time orientation that individual from low long-term orientation countries, okay, they're likely, uh, more likely to expect immediate gratification. So they're more short-term oriented, right? They want something right now. And individual from the weak foreign um, future tense reference countries, because they're thinking about the future more, they tend to save more and they retire with more wealth. So I think it's natural to think that investors may endogenously gravitate towards firms whose uh, time orientation suits their preference. That's almost saying like, I like to invest in companies who are speaking my language, 
right? Because usually investors start with their home country before they venture overboard. And I think that's a reasonable assumption to make. And that's how we validate uh, some of our um, tests later as well. And we think this, all these discussions will lead to the um, statement that investors' uh, cultural time reference may influence the time orientation of the firm disclosures. Leading to our first hypothesis, increases in ownership from relatively more long-term oriented foreign investors lead firms to disclose more long-term oriented words and using, uh, using fewer forward-looking statements. So how do we measure our uh, basically time orientation, the time orientation? We actually use three different proxies um, just because um, unlike um, you know, one plus one equals two, these cultural concepts, they're a little bit softer. So um, to make sure our measure captures this cultural um, time orientation, we use the regional Hofstetter country level measure, which is labeled LTO. As well, we augment that with the world value survey, which also measures the long-term orientation. And that follows closely with the LTO with like a high 0.8 or 0.9. I think we have in the paper of uh, correlations. And then lastly, we add this uh, future time reference. And to do this, we basically separate countries based on the future time reference of their dominant language. Okay, notice it's the dominant language. Because you're probably thinking, yes, we're in Singapore, then you know, Singapore usually speaks multiple languages. And that's kind of true starting from some other countries as well. So we do use its dominant language. And we do do some robustness to make sure that this is not going to impact anything by really excluding some countries that acknowledge they speak multiple languages, right? All right, and then we combine all these three measures into our cultural time. And this measure increases in terms of long-term orientation. This is something we want to make sure it came across is that whenever we're talking about cultural time orientation, we're talking in terms of long-term orientation. What it means is that cultural time orientation will go up when a, um, I guess when a country, when a firm or investor is considered long-term orientation. So it is positively related. This is our first empirical model. We look at the basic disclosure time versus the cultural time of the investors. And we use a slew of textual proxies just because you know why is never enough, right? Uh, we have the short-term horizon, which is short-term versus long-term. We use the future-oriented words. We use the past and we use the present. So we're, we're trying to make sure that we're really trying to capture this time concept in people's languages. And we expect beta two to be greater than zero. Notice it's a long-term concept, right? So they're all adjusted to become uh, long-term oriented. So our sample, as mentioned before, we looked at 37 countries um, across from 2000 to 2015. And uh, for the US firms, it's quite straightforward. We get it from the standard SEC EGAR. And for the non-US firms, we get it from the global reports database. After merging all the reports and converting and cleaning them, we have a reasonable size of 84,198. So this is the, um, I think the bread and butter of our paper because it breaks down all these uh, countries and it's quite interesting to look at them, okay? So on the extreme end, we have Japan and Taiwan and these countries oh, mostly located in Asia because their languages are um, you know, without future tenses. So their um, cultural time orientation, extremely high. That means they tend to be more long-term oriented. And I think that fits into our beliefs as well, given uh, what we know about the different nations. And the other end, we have Philippines with uh, almost a negative number because we do adjust these numbers, we standardize them and we combine them. So just wanna point out um, like um, Singapore, Switzerland is one of these countries also with four languages. And um, notice it's quite high because Switzerland, the dominant language would be the Swiss German 
or the German language. So it's very close to Germany. So intuitively, I think our measures make sense. And this is just gives you an idea of how things work. And you can see uh, how often um, these, I guess, these people from these nations tend to uh, um, invest in terms of turning over their uh, investments. And then the people with the long-term orientation tend to turn over a little bit less than the country with the short-term orientation. Okay, so our empirics. Um, so just wanna quickly go over the results. So this is all the measures we've used in the paper. So to basically show you the different textual variables we have, we have the different forward-looking statement, just because there are so many different versions for a uh, future-looking statement in the literature, but we don't actually have that much for the past and the present. So that's why we really only have two of them, but um, they're relatively consistent. And that shows our, um, that gives us some comfort that what we're, um, showing in the cultural time uh, orientation really makes sense. And uh, later on, we're going to merge all the variables together. So notice the disclosure time. Now it is a positive, okay? Now it is positive. Um, the reason for that is these are the raw textual measures. So they're actually going in the opposite direction. Once we merge them, we actually multiply by negative one so that all these measures are standardized in terms of long-term orientation. And it's really for simplicity and to uh, easy interpretation. So you notice these uh, numbers now are positive related. They're positive. My pen not as smooth as I thought. Okay, so they're all positive. Um, we have a bunch of uh, fixed effects. We pretty much can try to control for everything, you know, in the world. Uh, so uh, it's hard to make sure we have everything, but we do have a lot of fixed effects in here and different models to make sure that we are trying to capture um, the time orientation concept. And we can conclude from our table four that ownership from more long-term oriented foreign investors is associated with long-term oriented disclosures. To make sure our results are more robust, we're gonna do a difference in difference test. So this is the model. I won't spend as much time on explaining the variables going forward, just because um, by now we're almost 20 minutes. So hopefully uh, I still have most of you tuned in to me. Okay, so same concept, we want a positive coefficient because we expect long-term oriented countries to use more short-term once, uh, once they are included in the index fund. So this is our basic difference and difference model. And you can see that uh, most of the variables align to, uh, according to our expectations. And um, of course the difference and difference test is, um, it's good, but um, to make that model even better, we also conduct the two-stage instrumental variable, and which we think is stronger. So what we do here is um, we basically model the cultural time um, investors um, based on the MCSI uh, CI index inclusion to um, create um, a variable, instrumental variable, which we end up using here in the second model. Okay, so we're basically saying the exogenous characteristics of the MSCI is met because this is not, the, we're, we, we're not the one who invented this, by the way. Um, there have been like so many papers um, on international settings that use this proxy. So we're pretty comfortable that the IV we used here is really isolating the time disclosure um, orientation characteristics. So, after the two-stage instrumental variable, what we expect is that when we include long-term oriented investors, okay, that should result in more long-term and less forward-looking disclosures from investees. So with a beta equal uh, greater than zero. Here's our model. You can look at it in the paper if you um, download it from the website, bunch of fixed effects. So let's talk about uh, what this really means. All right, so we talked about uh, why it's important and now we're gonna look at why, what kind of consequences we have. So we have shown this, 
Okay, so now we're gonna show this in our step two. Step one, step two, economic consequences. We're actually, we're, we're not really sure what kind of economic consequences we're looking for. We think there might be something, but just because it's really hard to tell without really prior literature and how um, you know this language friction happens between nations, right? So what does it mean when someone who speaks um, a different language and has to communicate in English, the translation and so forth? So we're in the hypothesis, we don't really predict anything. We, we, um, we state that it do not affect firms' liquidity and cost of capital. So we go in there and try to see what, uh, I guess trying to see if we can find anything. Uh, to do that, we use a path analysis um, just because these variables are very interwined and we wanna make sure we really do capture the calm, um, the calm, sorry, the cultural time concept, how that impacts the IA and the cost of capital, information symmetry and um, cost of capital. And we can, look at our results because uh, all these symbols probably does not clarify things. Here are our results. We are interested in the indirect effect, okay? And what we're seeing here is we're actually a little bit surprised as well that we're seeing a positive and a quite strong one, okay? Coming from the disclosure time orientation of the investors and it is positive. So that means we're increasing information symmetry and bunch of fixed effects and uh, you know clustering and controls, we don't show them. We, we do have a lot and uh, all right. So, and then we move on to the cost of capital and similar to information symmetry, we use a slew of variables just because we really don't know which one's the best. And it's always nice to merge the different variables together to make sure that it loads, okay? We see an increase in cost of capital as well. We have a bunch of additional tests. Okay, we have um, petitioning based on cultural distance. We have um, active versus passive investors. And we have investor conference participation. So the idea of these different petitioning is really to show where this impact is coming from, okay? So if the cultural distance between the country and the investors are shorter, so what does that mean? And is there a difference between the active and the passive investors? So naturally you would think that active investors are probably gonna be the ones who are in, um, impacting the firm disclosures. And that's what we found. And another channel where this is coming through is the conference participation. So I guess right now it's even, it's even more important because nowadays uh, with Zoom and different kind of uh, conferencing, you can pretty much attend conferences worldwide, right? And that, that, I think that's a benefit and that's a very advantageous. And so what we do is um, we do look at the conference participation um, as a mechanism of how this investors would impact the firm's disclosures. And we look at a bunch of other disclosure attributes because you know, whenever you look at textual disclosures, there's so many other variables people want. So we add uh, a bunch of them. Uh, they are in the paper and um, some of them load, some of them don't, um, but it's always interesting to know. We control for a lot of things, as I mentioned earlier, um, just because when you're doing a study of this kind of scale, okay, you have many, many factors across countries and nations. So we do the religious control, you know, um, cultural control, um, different factors that this paper has, has uh, presented. And of course, we always try to exclude the US because um, if you saw our um, petitioning samples, just in case you saw them, I didn't show them here, uh, US is the dominant. It, it is by far the largest group of uh, firms in our um, sample. So we wanna make sure that when we exclude the US, our results are still holding and um, they do. So after all these additional tests, we think that we make three um, important contributions. We add to the literature by examining the foreign investors um, for institutional ownership on firm outcomes, because we are able to look at the cultural time orientation through how foreign investors affects disclosures. 
And we found that long-term oriented investors actually have some unintended consequences, such as lower liquidity and higher cost of capital. We add to the finance accounting literature on the cultural background on the supply side, because we do have a lot on the demand side, but we're adding to the supply side to really you know, make this picture whole, um, how investor cultures would come into play here. And lastly, um, we're adding to the textual uh, properties of the annual reporting across country setting. And, and I think this is becoming more and more important just because the world is becoming really small and um, culturally we are looking at different countries and how we invest in different nations. And we need to understand how different nations will communicate. So I wanna conclude by saying, I really appreciate this opportunity from the organized, um, I guess the organization committee, they've done a great job. All these reminders, wonderful. So I never forget. <laughs> and uh, each of us on this paper all speaks a different language and but we have the common language English, right? And then we think that a language and culture will continue to be important for accounting research and going forward. And I really look forward to Michael's comments and any other comments you guys might have in the Q&A section and uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Heather, for the wonderful presentations. So now let's welcome Michael from NUS to discuss the paper. Great. So thanks, Heather, for the great presentation. And also, I want to thank the conference organizer to, for the opportunity to uh, discuss this paper. So before I uh, get to the details, so I want to quickly summarize the main finding of the paper from my perspective. So I think the paper mainly document that the firms with home country and investor bases that are more long-term orientation, uh, they tend to use more long-term oriented words and fewer forward-looking uh, disclosure in their annual reports. And the author did a really nice job to try to use the MSCI index inclusion as a shock to enhance the causal inference. And in addition, they go beyond the disclosure and look at the, how those uh, long-term disclosure affect the firm's the liquidity and the cost of capital. And in addition, they also look at the real effects. So they might find that those firms invest more in R&D and SRG, but there is no change in the investment horizon. So as I had mentioned at the end of the presentation, they actually did a, a rich set of cross-section tests and additional tests. So I really admire their great efforts in that regards. So my overall impression of the paper is that I think the, the authors uh, bring a new perspective to examine the effects of the cultural time orientation on the corporate disclosure and the market consequence. So before I go to the details paper, I want to just uh, take a, a step back and try to look at the picture. So especially regarding the, the, the construct of the culture. So the cultural uh, construct is not a brand new thing in the financial accounting literature. So if you, if you look back at the earlier studies in the finance, so there have been shown that the, the cultural construct affects the, the individual's stock trading. So individuals try to, uh, are more likely to hold and treat the stocks the, uh, sharing the same back, uh, culture background. And also the, the individualism in that country also affect the trading volume, volatility, and the profits of momentum strategy in those countries. We also see that the, the, the role of the religion, which is the quite part of the culture actually affect the, uh, the different countries of investor rights protection. And the recent study also showed that the great cultural distance between the firms actually, actually are leading to a lower announcement returns for the cross-border m and transaction and the volume of the mergers. And moving to the corporate decision, there was a recent study also showed that the, for the firms located in the long-term orientation countries actually reduce the having behaviors and increase the cash holding, which kind of closely related to the, uh, the main construct that Heather, uh, Heather is looking at in this paper. And if we look moving back to the accounting literature, we can see there is actually a growing trend to look at the cultural language in the accounting literature. So regarding the corporate disclosure, we can see that the recent study by Landholm actually look at how the language barriers affect the foreign uh, firm disclosure, especially the MD sections in the uh, in the US markets. And also the another co-author in this paper actor, uh, Boshi actually look at the how the the managers from the uh, foreign countries actually provide more non plain English and Iranians, especially in the conference calls. And uh, you know, moving from that, the recent paper also look at how the one important uh, aspect of culture, which is the individualism, how that affects the manager's tone and the self-reference in the conference calls. 
And uh, by look, uh, two other uh, recent paper also look at the uh, a different dimension of the culture, which is uh, societal trust and how that affects uh, the market's reaction to the earnings amount announcements and the manager forecast for the firms uh, located in those uh, high societal trust countries. And moving beyond the corporate disclosure, there is also a recent study look at how the the, uh, the culture uh, con construct affects the uh, different accounting measures. For example, we have shown that the individual, the recent study have shown that individualism affects uh, leads to a low, a less conservative and the higher societal trust leads to less tax avoidance. And as I cited by in the, this paper as well, the key matter also show that if they're for those uh, firms located in the weak future reference countries, actually they are less likely to do the earnings management. And there was also a recent study look at analyst behavior to show how the individualism and the time orientation of those analyst cultural background affect their behavior in terms of forecast bias and recommendation and long-term forecast they provide, et cetera. So I think in, uh, from that regard, I think the Heather's paper actually bring a very new perspective in the first part is regarding how the cultural aspect affects the corporate disclosure, so which is kind of a nice add-on to the current literature. So uh, if we zoom into the, this paper, I think the first thing I want to uh, comment on is regarding the main construct, the investor time orientation uh, as measured by the uh, by Heather. So what we really, uh, what does this culture-based long-term orientation really capturing? So because based on my uh, reading from the paper, it seems like this, uh, this there is a huge overlap between this long-term orientation with, with the investor horizon, which is kind of we, uh, we we kind of can use this classification based on the Bushes classification of institutional investors. And the main argument the authors use to form the hypo hypothesis is actually based on this uh, Cadmon et al. 2019 paper, which is essentially they are using this uh, venture capitalist accident behavior, which is uh, by design is a hard term, uh, short term horizon in an IPO setting. So in that sense, I feel like there is no much, uh, too much close discussion is how this uh, specific culture based on long term orientation linked to this uh, disclosure time orientation. If we if we do not consider what is the essentially what what new insight we can learn go beyond the investment uh, investor horizon we are looking at here. And kind of along this line is, then it uh, leads me to think about, is this culture-based long-term orientation is really captured by the organization or is by the managers? Because if you think about this, uh, uh, if you think about the, the disclosure orientation as the author mentioned in the paper that the manager plays an important role shaping the firm's disclosure. And actually then when they measure this, uh, the firm's time orientation, they are actually alternatively measure those uh, uh, investing firms time orientation at the CEO level. So, and however, when we look at the investor time orientation, I think also is mainly measure this, uh, this orientation, time orientation at the institution level, which means essentially they are treating all the funds of all the institution fabric from the same company at the same, with the same orientation. And however, if you look at finance literature, we can see that actually the mutual fund managers or the, those fund managers plays a very important role in their stock pickings. So maybe uh, uh, just uh, consistent with what we others do regarding the firm C, uh, managers, maybe the authors can also try to measure the, the investor time offering at the fund manager level. So that is kind of go beyond just uh, the fund level and which is for the fund level, we can actually use to rely on the Boucher's classification and control for this fund level a fund level investor horizon, then to look at what is going beyond, what's the culture aspect of this uh, uh, fund manager playing a role in the shifting the, the disclosure time orientation. And the second, I want to uh, talk about this, uh, how the author to construct this uh, disclosure time orientation. So I, 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 I want to give a lot of credit to the author to try to come up with this uh, comprehensive list of uh, seven different measures of this uh, uh, disclosure time orientation. But one thing I think the author maybe want to uh, discuss more in the paper is that regarding why do they choose the annual report at the first place? Considering in the literature, we have used some other alternative like the conference calls, earnings release. So what is the benefit of using the annual reports? So specifically regarding annual reports, I can see a one problem essentially is I wonder, are those long-term oriented words, which is kind of one important component of the, just the disclosure time orientation, are those words driven by the fundamentals? So I think in this paper, the author now uh, uh, just uh, applied the word list from the Boshi et al. 27, which is based on conference call to this whole annual reports. So actually I, I just uh, simply pull out this uh, uh, annual report by Delta Airlines in 2015. So if I search for the long-term phrase, 
actually they show up by uh, 63 times, but about 30 times is actually re are referring to long-term debt and about 10 times are referring to the long-term rate and another five times referring to long-term investments. So it's actually over about the 70% are actually referring to accounting jargons or accounting terms. So in that sense, I think it may be kind of introduce a lot of noise when we construct measure. So to that perspective, I think the authors may consider like restrict their uh, measures only to this, uh, maybe certain part of the annual report. For example, as the price study use, maybe only focus on the m and section of the firms listed in the US markets so that we can see that it's less, the, less affected by those accounting terms, which is uh, associated with the so-called the long-term freeze, et cetera. Or maybe they can try the other types of disclosure. But I think they also may want to discuss more why they choose the annual report at first place. And regarding the second component of the, this uh, disclosure time orientation, the authors kind of in place assume that this more future time reference kind of lead, are preferred by the uh, uh, short-term investors. But if you look at this, a lot of those forward-looking statements mentioned in those end reports, some of them actually could be long-term. So it's uh, if you look at them, March layout 2015, they actually classify both the forward-looking statement in the two different uh, types, the short-term and long-term. So maybe I think the others can try to separate this type to, to uh, enhance inference when we construct this uh, disclosure time orientation measures. And next one, I want to briefly talk about this uh, MSCI inclusion test. So uh, as they has mentioned, this is kind of not, not new, uh, a new setting or new instrument they introduced to the literature. The, the, in the prior literature, a lot of studies have used this SMSCI inclusion and they use this shock and to say that this shock actually leading to the more foreign institution investors, but not domestic institution investors. So now I think the authors are trying to build this, uh, to identify or build this causal effects of investor-based time orientation on the investee firm's disclosure time orientation. So I think the right now the different deep tests the author use kind of using this risk of zero to one time orientation of the firm's uh, of the firm's home country, which is the the DM culture time in Table Five to gauge the direction. But I think it's kind of more intuitive to me that it's more like the the MSCI inclusion affects the more uh, foreign institutional investors. Maybe we can uh, the direction of that. Uh, change in the investor's time orientation is more effective by depends on the existing level of the investor time orientation rather than this uh, the firm investees their own home or uh, the home country investor uh, home country time orientation measures and i think another type another way the authors can go is maybe can they can try to construct some measure of this uh, the average time orientation of this exogenous uh, influx of the foreign institution investor brought by this mci index inclusion and try to see, uh, try to build a window around this uh, inclusion uh, event, and to see how that exhaustion is change or the increase in the long term orientation, and how that leading to the disclosure time orientation. I think that will be more intuitive for for at least for me to understand how that mechanism uh, goes. And next, I want to uh, briefly talk about this uh, the capital market consequence. So I think the others uh, kind of be, uh, uh, conduct this uh, past analysis and try to uh, to show that this uh, the investor the investor time orientation leading to increase in this uh, disclosure time orientation and essentially that leading to this uh, uh, effects on the liquidity and uh, cost of capital. So this one thing one finding kind of uh, uh, makes me wonder is how do we interpret this uh, direct effect of the disclosure uh, time orientation on the liquidity and cost of capital. I think kind of that's kind of the one of the key component the, when others try to build this uh, the doing the past analysis. And I think the author has, uh, has mentioned in the, in the presentation, they actually do not have much predictions. So I think extent it's kind of, I think the authors may want to give more discussion of this uh, potential direction of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, this direct effect. And one thing I can think of is because this uh, disclosure time orientation, a large component is actually leading to related to the forward-looking statements. So if you look at the recent, uh, the two related studies in the forward-looking uh, forward uh, statement, they actually find that those uh, the lead 20, uh, 10, they show that the forward-looking statement actually are both very informative about the firm's future earnings. And this uh, forward-looking statement uh, also uh, uh, improve the firm's information efficiency or the stock price uh, as uh, shown by the Maslow et al. 2015. So actually, I think overall, this two kind of study maybe give the author some idea of the 
the shorter shorter disclosure time organization, which in century is a more forward-looking statements or disclosures, may improve the information environment of firms. Then that kind of leading to this uh, uh, less liquidity, uh, sorry, the higher liquidity and cost capital. And because now the authors measure this the disclosure time oriented in the opposite direction, so that's leading maybe leading to their uh, prediction they have here. But that kind of one uh, one way to think about that. And in contrast, actually, I think about maybe maybe there is the on the other hand is when we think of why this uh, is such a direct threat, maybe there should be non results because if you think about those the if you think consider those the domestic institutional investors will they be effective if they could rely on some other disclosure which is essentially in their mother tongue for, for example if you think about the the Japanese institutional investor investor Japanese company they don't have to rely on the the any version of this uh, any reports because essentially all those uh, the starting point of this uh, the, this uh, disclosure time orientation management is based on in English test. So in that sense, I think maybe the authors can build up upon tension that is those institu institutional investors will not be affected if they are the main dominant source of the uh, driving those liquidity and cost capital. And when and another thing I want to mention about is uh, here I think uh, when also talk about this uh, foreign investor reliance on this uh, annual reports, actually they make the implicit assumption that that's the, the only uh, the source they can gather the information. And if you think about the, maybe there are a possibility that a lot of those big mutual funds or the funds they have this, uh, maybe they have the in-house analysts, maybe actually understand Japanese. So man, that's maybe those kind of arguments, I think maybe leading to a non-result. So that's why I think the authors can discuss more about these two different directions and build up this tension. Uh, rather than we just, just uh, simply leave the, this uh, prediction to the data. And last thing I want to uh, kind of along this slide, because as we mentioned about the domestic institution investors and this the foreign uh, institution investors, I think one thing the authors may be considered as about this uh, mis mismatch in, in the culture, because as we said, the domestic institution matter, they kind of can rely on their own mother tongue to interpret the, the, firm's, uh, the firm's news or firm's information. But for the foreign uh, institute investor, it's maybe more difficult for them to do that. So, and I think currently when the authors measure this uh, investor uh, time orientation, they kind of take the average of the all institutional investors. So maybe I think in this case, to, uh, to lead to this liquidity and cost capital, the author may, may consider about uh, construct some measure of this cultural difference in the dimension of the time orientation between the foreign and domestic institution investor. That's my leading to more like this uh, uh, competing forces between this uh, two type of the, the institution, institutional investors. Okay, so I think that's uh, pretty much all I have. And to conclude, I think this, uh, this paper provides a, a new perspective, uh, especially from the cultural perspective on measuring the institutional investors, uh, the cultural time orientation and the documents of rich set or improved settings. So, and I basically, my discussion tried to provide some uh, discussion or suggestion on this, uh, uh, how to discuss more investor time orientation and its mechanisms and some suggestion on measuring this uh, disclosure time orientation. And I hope my suggestion comments will be helpful for others. And uh, last uh, to the others, best luck with the publication process. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the, for the wonderful discussions. Now, Heather, would you like to respond to some of the comments here? Yeah, wow, well, Michael, I think you did a better job than we did in terms of uh, coming out all these prior literature and citing all these uh, important uh, papers. So first, uh, I would love to have your slides. Um, and I'm jotting down some things as you were speaking. And sure, sure. Um, I touched up on a couple of them. So obviously I cannot answer all of them because you had some really great suggestions. And since we're also in the process of revising the paper, I think there are some things we are looking at them. So um, I think going back to one of the main things we do uh, have to answer a little bit more is why annual reports, right? Because uh, I think it really comes down to the data availability as well as the fact that it is all in English. Um, because we're making the inherent assumption that when you do translate, and these languages characteristics do come across because we've all heard how people speak in English when they're native Tone, I guess, when their native language is not English. So they do sound different, right, in terms of how they use words and how they use phrases. So we think that when you do translate, some of the things do come across. And um, let's see, um, let's see, accounting terms, yes. 
um, that's a, that's a, something we do need to address in the paper in terms of would the word less capture more in, in it should. And I think you're gonna always have this problem, right? Cause we're using different word lists and we're always gonna have problems where different accounting terms might uh, mitigate what we're trying to um, find. Um, we actually thought about extracting certain parts. Um, we got started with the UK and Canada and Australia because they, these are much closer to US companies because they actually have something similar to the MDNA and we stopped because it was taking way too long and you wouldn't believe the, even with US, I guess outside of US, even with Canada and UK and Australia, they tend to be more comparable, but they still do not have a systematic ways of all these, for example, MDNAs that they would disclose. For example, UK actually have several sections that you would consider to be MDNAs. So um, that's why we stopped. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was taking quite some time and um, I'm not sure it would, maybe a small sample on one country might do, but we just don't know how much information that will add. So I think at the end of the day, we use the whole um, annual report. Um, but we do try to see if we can exclude certain terms. That will be a suggestion we can do in your robustness. We can exclude certain accounting terms and see if our results will still hold, right? Um, let's see, um, yes, the murkiness between the long-term versus the short-term when it comes to forward-looking statements. That's something I highlighted during the presentation as well. And we continue to struggle with that just because um, it is a bit murky because when you're talking about long-term orientation, people immediately think about the future, all right? But actually it's counterintuitive. When you actually long-term, if you go back to the original Hofstadter discussions, when you're thinking long-term, you're actually persistently doing the same thing as what you're doing right now. So presently, um, you're I guess you're carrying on your tasks. You know, you're, every day you're doing something. You're being persistent. You're following your um, uh, the same patterns that you've had done in the last year or so. And in order to do this, you're achieving a long-term um, goal into the future. So that's why it is quite different from the future orientation. Because I always like to bring the concept of with uh, forward-looking statements, right? You can talk about the future as much as you want. You know, you can proceed to the future, but does it really mean you're gonna achieve your future um, goals and objectives? Probably not. So that's um, something we need to um, be even more clear on in the paper. Let's see, I like your fund manager level um, suggestion. It's very interesting. We do uh, look at different managers and different types, but maybe this is something we can uh, further bring to our paper. Uh, it is a bit of a battle about which tables to keep in the paper. We also have an online appendix with even more tables. So I'm not sure uh, um, how many tables we can add, but the fund manager, I, I, that's a very interesting uh, suggestion. Let's see what else I can comment on. Um, before I move on. The suggestion on the MSCI index, uh, we are currently working on some tests to make sure that this proxy we're using is really exogenous in our setting. We, um, we are aware of there's some papers that are showing that because there's so many papers, right? There are hundreds and hundreds of them that have used the MSCI index for this sort of exogenous shock for different disclosure settings, right? Everybody's using them just because, you know, um, we are all limited, we're aware of data limitation of these exciting exogenous uh, shocks. Um, we are trying to replicate and bootstrapping some um, tests uh, that's taking its time unfortunately, to show that the MS, um, MSCI is actually working in our setting. Um, hopefully we can bring that in later. Okay, so moving on to your sort of the last comment on us not making a prediction on the economic consequences. Um, it, it might be helpful to the readers if we can uh, introduce more comments. Right now, uh, the discussion in the paper is quite thin. Um, um, it might be a little bit rough in terms of how we discuss liquidity and cost of capital. We sort of thought like, we just, you know, probably got just thrown in there. It's not like the discussion is really thin. So um, we can probably enrich the discussion why we're looking at the liquidity and the cost of capital and some of the tensions surrounding these proxies and what kind of consequences we expect. Um, it is just hard because, um, 
these domestic settings, at the end of the day, they're speaking the same language. You've been in that country, so you're more customer to how people are thinking and talking. So um, we're not sure we can have the exact mapping. There's always a slight difference, but maybe we can make some stronger statement on which side it might lean to. But uh, we think our results sort of make sense because we're basically saying there is a language friction here. Right. There is a language friction when you are um, communicating in a language that you're not used to. There's going to be some misunderstanding. There's going to be some friction and that can have some unintended consequences and. Um, not, you know, everything in moderation. Right. That's usually a, a standard. So excessive short term is not good. Excessive long term is not good. Trying to do something that's unnatural to you is probably not good. So um, maybe we can add in some of more discussion to see how we build up on the consequences. Uh, let's see. The very last thing I want to get to before I move on, because I know I've been talking a lot, um, is this interesting idea of really having Japanese uh, analysts looking at uh, Japanese companies. Um, Absolutely. Uh, but I would say that maybe that's becoming more and more frequent right now, but maybe the sample period we're looking at right now, I don't think it's necessarily that easy to find someone who's native and um, who can converse in that language. So, um, you know, I was working in Singapore for a long time. My husband did as well. He's always struggled, right? Because uh, just because, you know, he's not from uh, this culture. So he always felt there's a bit of a barrier in terms of how he communicated with his other coworkers and stuff. So I think that um, even if you grow up, like it's not that easy. Like you have to be in that country. You have to be using these technical terms, right? And for some of us, maybe you have another language that's native to you, but you might not be able to do your technical work in that language because doing technical work in that language can be very different than just simply speaking that language. So, and given that our sample period is a little bit, you know, behind uh, our current time, I think that maybe it's not that easy, but it's definitely a feasible thing. We can maybe um, discuss it at least um yeah so i think i'm gonna stop right now <laughs> i think i've um, taken too much time so um thank you so much again uh, michael and i look forward to rereading your slides and uh, clarifying my thoughts thank you heathers uh, now we're going to open the question to the floor uh, so the first question is from Wen Jie. Hi, hi um i had to can you hear me hi. yes i hear you thanks so um I, I think uh, I, I, I know that a lot of people frame the uh, myopia problem as a behavioral or like in your case, a cultural problem. Um, but another way to think about a myopia problem is to think of it as, a, as an institutional problem, perhaps due to uh, inefficient contracting or political incentive and all kinds of uh, institutional issues. So how, how, how do I distinguish between the two uh, from an empirical? Uh, setting, or, or, or you just assume that it's a it's a behavioral problem rather than a institutional problem. Okay, so uh, I'm not. I wouldn't necessarily put it as a problem per se. I think it's more of a, a characteristic we're looking at, right? Because it doesn't need to be a problem. We basically found some negative consequences but it doesn't necessarily have to be an issue. Uh, but uh, going back to what you're saying about how this might you know, be interacted with political and other factors, we do control for a lot of things, um, but I do agree that it's almost empirically impossible. I would say empirically possible <laughs> to isolate completely that what we found is what we found. This is why we have so many controls in the paper. I think Michael, after seeing the paper, seeing all these uh, control variables, hopefully will agree. Uh, we do control for political, religious, and all these um, uh, factors, but um, it's, it's as complete as we can get. But we do think with some validation that we did at the beginning of the paper, uh, we show that this cultural effect is coming across. Yeah, I'm not sure that if that makes you uh, 
on board. <laughs> but uh, it, yes, it's more, it is it's a more soft, about, It's more yeah. about open question. So uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, because I, I'm always um, um, uh, yeah. It because, is a soft. It's absolutely agree with you. It is a soft concept. It's not like one plus one, like I said in the presentation. One plus one equals two. So we do struggle with that. It is a softer concept. It, and how, it, it, yeah. It, it, it's, it's more of a view of two words. It's uh, if I read a lot of empirical papers, they talk about my apia in the sense of, uh, in terms of behavioral bias. And uh, but when when um, I look at the theoretical um, uh, models, and my apia is more of a consequence of some institutional um, um, uh, uh, institutional problems. Like, for example, the the contract is not uh, complete or um, uh, it's not efficient and uh, and uh, but I think that's a, a fundamental issue in this topic, right? Because why is something inherent in, in people and why is about uh, the environment um, uh, that people uh, that people are in, right? Uh, if it is an institutional problem, I, I think um, it, it, they have totally com completely different uh, implications for, um, uh, for what I, we can do to um, to overcome the uh, issues caused by uh, myopia, right? But if, if it is a cultural problem, then uh, there's nothing you want to do about it, and it's impossible to do to 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 overcome. And if it is an institutional problem, so uh, we can think about why one country has better institution than the other country, and what we can learn from it, right? So I think they have completely different implications. Uh, for us, um, that, that's a, that's more of an open question. Uh, I, I'm yeah, not, uh, that's a philosophical question. I think it's very interesting. Is whether we're learning something or we're just doing something to, you know, add to uh, our current understanding. I I think that it's about opening the discussion and really understanding certain facts. And uh, hopefully, as we get into these more international settings, we will understand more and more. But um, yeah, I think um, I think maybe you can, right? You can try to incorporate some of the biases. For example, people have looked at different psychological biases in, in how humans process information. And by knowing these biases, you might never be able to eradicate them, but I think you might be able to improve on them, right? But we all know that, you know, we, we tend to sometimes do things irrationally or something, but it just you know baby steps <laughs> because, because in terms of culture right we want to respect others culture uh, but yes. when it comes to like institutions we want to be more critical we want to be uh, like think about how to um, improve or change uh, the the institution so uh, I, I think it, it that totally different mindset but it just right. like so, like odd to me that the the literature only look at the the the, the behavioral aspect of it. Um, uh, that, that's it. That's more of an open question. Thank you. Thanks, Wenji. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, we've got another question from Pierre. Uh, just a quick comment that I. Yes. Wenji, yes. I, I think some people may argue culture is a, simply a slow moving institution. So, <laughs> It's it's subject to change, but very slowly. <laughs> uh, um, a CMU graduate, right? Oliver Williamson. <laughs> oh, I see. All right. Um, are there any other questions? All right, if not, uh, we are finishing two minutes ahead of schedules. Um, so we will conclude this session now and we will uh, reconvene at 11 a.m. at Singapore time. Thank you so much. <laughs>